Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Gravy Podcast. On this episode, we're taking on something very important for sales professionals, mental resilience. How do you maintain your mindset and protect your mindset in a world that is being turned upside down every single day with volatility and uncertainty? Before we get started, I want you to go check out Sales Gravy University. We've added 60 courses so far this year to Sales Gravy University from some of the top minds in sales. In fact, we have more than 40 of the top minds in sales who are producing content on Sales Gravy University. And that's why sales teams around the globe are coming to Sales Gravy University for their entire team. And individuals who want to invest in themselves are grabbing all access passes so that they can take these new courses, plus the thousands of hours of courses that we currently have available on the platform. And the one thing that most people who use Sales Gravy University know that is uh, different about Sales Gravy is that we produce live courses every single week. So two to three courses taught by our master trainers. You can go to a classroom with your peers. And this year we even launched peer groups or mastermind groups. So you can go into a group and solve some of your toughest challenges with people who are just like you. You can check out Sales Gravy University right now for free if you go to the the platform at learn.salesgravy.com and use the code free course. Now, this is for people who have never taken a course on Sales Gravy. So if you are already a member, this won't work for you. But if you've never taken a course, go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com and choose the code free course. We've got Robin Hills with us today. He's a business psychologist and an expert in emotional intelligence. He's also from the UK, so he's got a delightful accent, which I really like. And we were talking earlier about how much we watch the BBC shows because we've got a BritBox subscription that's just awesome. And uh, But this is a really good time to start talking about emotional intelligence. It's uh, been a subject that really Daniel Goleman kind of launched this with his book, Emotional Intelligence, I don't know, what, 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, But it's... Um, it's a it's a, a place where it's I think some people don't really understand what it means, but we all know that we can get better at it. Like we can grow and develop our emotional intelligence with time. And that's exactly what you do, Robin. You coach people to get better and to improve their ability to deal with other people. Before we get started, I, I just want you to be able to tell people just a little bit about yourself and what you do and why they should pay attention to you. Sure. Thank you ever so much, first of all, for having me on your podcast, Jeff. It's an absolute pleasure to be on here. Sales and selling is very, very close to my heart. I started my career as a salesman back at the beginning of the 80s. And I have been selling consistently ever since. Okay, I don't have the title salesperson now, but I proudly wore that badge for well over a quarter of a century. So I feel as if I've earned my spurs, as it were, and uh, can come along and talk to you about selling. But um, ever since Daniel Goldman, that you alluded to in the introduction, published his books, I've been fascinated by the topic of emotional intelligence. And when a couple of my roles made redundant at the beginning of the century, I took the decision to set my own business up focusing in specifically on helping people to develop their emotional intelligence. And that's where I am today, a very successful business called EI for Change. And we work globally to deliver the message about emotional intelligence, what it is, what it means, and how it can help to improve performance. And you wrote a book called The Authority Guide in Emotional Resilience in Business. Uh, And I'm, I'm, I think emotional resilience or mental resilience really resonates with me right now simply because we're just in a really weird world. I wrote a book earlier this year called Selling in a Crisis, and it really detailed what salespeople have to change and think about as they as we move into a new economy and a world that is just is turned upside down. I mean, we've got wars going on. We've got political strife. We've got all kinds of things happening. And uh, and and some people are are not doing very well with it. I was talking to a CEO the other day ago that was um, just shocked that some of the salespeople were having to take mental health breaks because they were unable to cope with what was happening and the pressure that's on them. And let me let me lay this up for you, Robin. A lot of salespeople are under a lot of pressure right now to sell because customers are being pulling back and and sales cycles have increased in in their length. 
and buying decisions have moved upward in the organization to the C-suite because companies are protecting themselves. They're more risk averse. And this is juxtapositioned against the last two years where salespeople simply showed up to work and picked up the phone and people were calling them to buy stuff. And you could essentially fog a mirror and you would be okay. And because of, of where we are, salespeople are having to make this switch. So mental resilience or emotional resilience in the face of this uncertainty to me has taken center stage. And that's really where I, 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 I want to, to be able to get you to talk a little bit to the audience about what is emotional resilience or mental resilience? How, how does it manifest itself? How do you, how do you even begin to, to get your arms around um, where, where you even fit on a scale, you know, of, from emotional resilience? Am I, you know, am I a complete snowflake and I can't handle anything? Or, you know, am I a sociopath and nothing bothers me? Like where, you know, where do I fit on that scale and what do I need to do? To, um, to to kind of maybe even assess where I am, but start working on my own emotional resilience? Well, I think what we've got to do is to start by saying uh, that mentally uh, salespeople are fairly resilient in themselves. They've got an ability to take a lot from customers, from clients. They have bad days. They have good days like everybody else. And uh, a lot of salespeople don't necessarily work out of an office. Some of them are field-based and field-based salespeople have to motivate themselves. So they've got to have a kind of intrinsic motivation, an inner motivation, a drive that will get them up in the morning and get them out seeing their clients to sell to them. Now, where does that come from? Uh, you know, there's no boss hanging over them telling them what to do. They've got to do it for themselves. They've got to want to do it. And I think before we start looking at uh, emotional resilience, to honor your listeners, I think what we've got to do is to help them to understand what emotional intelligence is. <laughs> and then we can build upon that in terms of emotional resilience. So very, very simply, I know you know this, Jeb, but this is more for your listeners and for making me feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, emotional intelligence is the way in which you combine your thinking with your feelings in order to build up good quality relationships and make good authentic decisions. It's as simple as that, yet it's very, very complicated and very difficult to do, particularly when there's a lot of turmoil, particularly when you're under a lot of pressure. How do you work with your thinking and combine them with your feelings when they are so intense and they're wanting to draw you away from what it is that you want to do. And that's where your decision making comes in. And also, that's where your relationships come in. So I think it's very vitally important. Let, let's take people well away from the sales situation. It's vitally important to have good quality relationships so that you can go to people and say to them, look, I'm having a bad day. Will you just sit and listen to me? Will you talk to me? Can we talk about something other than work? Can we do something together? that uh, will take my mind off things that are going on at work so that I can just have a break and then I can get back to it the very next day. You talk about, you know, let's say, let's think about, you know, emotional intelligence in terms of uh, emotions. I always think about it as it's the ability to understand and manage your emotions so that you can influence the emotions of other people, right? So this is right like selling. And the thing about emotions is we just don't choose our emotions. The emotions happen, right? We can only choose our response to the emotion. So in other words, emotions are happening without your consent. Things come at you. You like you, for example, let's say you pick up your phone and you read in the Wall Street Journal that, you know, another company's just laid off another thousand people. In that moment, you may have the emotion of fear because that would be a natural thing for a human to feel when they see something that's a threat. It's the choice in that moment when you when you see that to to am I gonna respond and react to this brief emotion or fear? Or am I going to look at the world and say, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that when my company is looking at people who, in your words, in the words of the of the British, my favorite word for getting fired is redundant, right? And so, so they're looking at the people that are redundant. They're not looking at me, right, because I'm doing that. Or do you get caught up in the fear and start changing your behavior in a way that that actually puts you in danger? Why should I even try? They're probably going to lay me off anyway, right? Or do you go home and you know yell at your kids or yell at your spouse because 
you're afraid. Those are all choices that you can make. Now, what you described to me was where, where I think this emotional resilience really comes into play, and that is when you're under pressure and under stress, it's easy to say you get to choose your response, but it's a lot harder like when everything is hitting you all at one time. So you see that article and then you go to work and then your boss sits down with you and says you're behind the number. And then the CEO comes in and says, look, folks, we have got to get moving. We're failing right now. We're not hitting our number. And then you call a customer up who you thought you were going to close. And then suddenly they say, hey, my boss said we're going to hold off for a while. I mean, in that moment, like that's when it all comes together. And like this whole concept of mil, you know, mental resilience, being able to go from setback to comeback, in your words, like that's where it gets tough. Like so, so and and everybody who's listening knows what I'm talking about. That I mean, it happened to me this morning. I'm like, I I had a setback this morning that was just, it just hurt. Like it was so painful because we worked so hard to get to this next run, and then all of a sudden, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And my first thought personally was, uh, I just want, I just want to just, I'm gonna close my computer up. I mean, I'm gonna go do something else. I'll give up. And then, but then I got pissed off, but I got pissed off. You know, I got pissed off and said, screw that. I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm going to come back. I'm going to double down. I'm going to fix this because I can. It's just going to stink. But, you know, but in that moment, you're making those choices. What's the formula for that? Like, how do you, how do you do that? Some of this is 40 years of experience and, you know, in, in being a business and I don't have another choice, but there's a lot of people that, like they don't know what to do, so they get em- they either become immobilized, they become paralyzed, or they act out in ways that are self-destructive. Sure, sure. You raise so many good points there, Jeff. Uh, I think the important thing is you might see an article which instills a degree of fear in you. You have no choice over the fact that you're experiencing fear. The reason why we experience emotions is they are a reaction to our environment. They're a reaction events and they're preparing our body body, mentally and physically for that event so it affects our physiology and it affects our psychology and the intensity of the emotion just compounds with event event after event after event after event so it then gets to a point where they are so intense it's very easy for you and I to sit here and talk about oh you could make a choice But the reality of it is when you are faced with such intensity of the emotions that you are experiencing, you can't make a simple, effective choice. The choice might just be a case of, you know, I'm going to shut the computer down. I'm going to go and do something else for half an hour, an hour. And yeah, you might not feel that you've got that choice, but you have got that choice. Get yourself in the right mental place in order to pick yourself up, dust yourself down, and get back to what it is that you're intending to do. What is it that keeps people from making the comeback? Like how, you know, you, let me give you an example. Um, This is real life. So we were working on this contract with this company, and it was a million dollar deal. The sales rep did everything right. She executed perfectly. We got to the place where we said, okay, we're ready to go. We gave her a verbal agreement. She sent us a contract. And then we took the contract uh, and my CFO and I, and we set for on it for a couple of days and we thought about it. And then we looked at the, the economy and the, you know, the winds of change and said, we can't in good faith for our company, like as good stewards of our organization, sign us up for a long-term seven figure agreement with all the things that are chaining out changing out there and we made the gut wrenching decision not to sign the agreement and i had to make the call and tell the salesperson that we weren't going to do business and it was a gut punch for her she was counting on it and there was nothing that she did wrong there was and there was nothing that she could do to change it like she couldn't there's no it wasn't an objection that was she was going to be able to overcome because we were making a strategic decision for the business we weren't and we had given it thought at that moment, like it's really easy for a salesperson to lose faith. And what I mean by that is lose faith that they should continue to do the right things, start making shortcuts, become cynical in their approach, uh, have their attitude impacted. 
And and I think sometimes they you don't even know that those little things are happening to you. You know, you change your self talk, like you start having this conversation with yourself about how buyers are bad. You know, these people that I'm doing business with, you begin to have contempt for them. I mean, all of that happens and I uh, and you start spiraling downward. And at some point, most people catch themselves. Either you get caught, you know, you, your boss comes to you and confronts you, or your spouse comes to you and confronts you, or a friend comes and confronts you, or you hit enough bottoms that suddenly you're like, I've got to do something about this. But how how can people, you know, how can a person who gets in that situation where they they get a gut punch, how do they stop that spiral from happening before it happens? Like what's the what's the what's the framework that they need to go through to remind themselves that the more you do things right, the more you you are consistent, the more successful you're going to be over time. You're just not going to win them all, and you can't allow yourself this luxury of the negative thought. Yep, I, I think the, the the important thing there is to look at what you've been uh, striving towards looking at in this uh, interview, and that that's mental resilience. Now, um, I think what we've got to do is just to accept that there are going to be certain circumstances and certain situations where you do get a gut punch, and you just got to kind of accept that it's going to hurt it's not going to be pleasant there's going to be an intensity of that emotion um but the the real definition of resilience particularly emotional resilience is having a clear understanding a realistic optimism around what it is that you're trying to do and retain that level of optimism knowing full well that uh, life is just going to throw stuff at you that you're going to have to deal with. So it's having a clear vision of what it is that you're intending to do, what your outcomes are, understanding that there is some meaning in what you're doing, and then having the flexibility and the adaptability to be innovative and to work around it. Again, look, it's very easy for you and I to sit here in the cold light today and have these discussions. But when you're going through the intensity of that emotion and the fact that you've got other compounding issues, it is incredibly hard. And this is where developing the right relationships and the right, uh, the right support network comes in, in order that you can go to that network and get the help and support that you need. And within that network, it's going along to your manager and saying, we have got this problem. This is the issue. This is where it stands. This is what I've done. Help me. What can we do from here? What can we do from here? So it's not a case of um, taking it very much all on yourself and blaming yourself. Now, the important thing is in good times, it's to build up the trust and the relationship with your manager in order to have that cathartic discussion when it's necessary. Now your manager is going to be feeling the same level of intensity of emotions. They're not going to hit their sales target. They've got to become flexible and adaptable. They've got to go to their managers, their leaders and say, we've got issues. We're not going to hit our targets. So it affects everybody. And I think by sharing a problem, it helps. We've got some hackneyed expressions here in the United Kingdom, a problem shared is a problem halved. And I think it's very, very relevant here. Go and talk to your spouse, uh, go and talk to your friends. Um, have you got friends where you can have those sort of discussions? They might be colleagues within work. They might be, they might even be other clients. Who knows, but who is in your network who can give you this when you need it, because the worst case scenario is that you go into depths of despair and you will go down into despair as part of the change curve as you're going through change and you're adapting. But your responsibility is to make sure if you possibly can to not let that generate into depression, clinical depression. So what is it that you can do to prevent yourself from going down that route? So I love this idea of having a support group, people you talk with. I think that's super important. 
one thing though that occurs to me in situations like this is that sometimes it's not so much support, but it's you have a complaining group. So you move from uh, talking about how you feel to moving into complaining, and there's tons of people that you can complain to. And I'm 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 very uh, conscious of that. Like this morning, a little setback, I wanted to call a friend of mine who's in my mastermind group and talk about it. And I realized that there was nothing that anybody could do to fix it. And the only way that we were going to get out of this was to start over again. And that that call would simply be an opportunity for me to complain. And I really did want to complain. Like I wanted to. And I stopped myself. And it was the right move. Because the one thing that I know about complaining is like complaining is like misery's mating call. Like the more you complain, the more you you talk that talk negative, the more negative you become. And the thing that about misery is misery loves company and it wants you on its team. So it, you attract other complainers. And that can that can lead to that spiral, especially on sales floors. Like that, that's when you start getting validated. You come up with this belief system that all buyers are liars, right? So then everybody then then validates buyers are liars. And then you start believing that and you change the way that you do things. Um, it's, it's, by the way, no different than it's, especially in sports. Um, you see, I was practicing my golf swing last night, for example, and I was, I was like hitting these perfect pitches, perfect. And then suddenly I forgot how to do it. And what I did was I started making these little changes because one thing happened, another thing happened, another thing happened. And pretty soon I can't even hit the ball. Like I can't, it's the craziest thing. And what did I have to do? I had to say, back to the basics, faith in, here's how you grip the ball, grip the club, here's how you swing the ball club, here's where you put your eyes, here's where you move your feet. And then as soon as I did that, I back to hitting perfect pitches again. But if, even in that little moment, just mentally, I just switched the way that I was doing things. And I think that can happen to us as well. We, we meet with complainers or we meet with other people and we start making these change-ups and then suddenly... We, we start making poor decisions about how we're going to go about the sales process, and that creates more misery. And that, to me, is a big deal. So I think there's a big difference between having a support group, people you can go talk to. And I agree with you. Like, if you've got bad news, take peel the Band-Aid off and let's talk about it now. Don't hold on to it. There's nothing worse than holding on to bad news because then you got a hundred percent of it on you, and it doesn't age well with time, and that causes other problems. But I also think that there's a difference between being able to sit down and have constructive conversations about something bad that may have happened, and we're always going to have bad things happen in sales, and and what the next step is. How are you going to handle that? And recognizing that as you as you lose faith in the process, no different than Michael Gosling, right? You 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 get further and further off track. So you can't allow bad things that happen to you to take you off of the process. So I want you to talk about those two things is how do you form a group of people around you that really can support you versus being a group of people that you complain with? And then how do you avoid allowing cynicism to impact your faith and the systems and process that we know that over time, if we execute them consistently, statistically speaking, we'll get more wins than we get losses. Can I go back to some basics here, sure. Jeb? Let's go back to the basic definition of emotional intelligence that I gave you. And I, you know, I like the way in which you were talking about emotions, but um, being smart with your feelings in order that you can build up good quality relationships and make good, authentic decisions. So um, what we've got to do is to look at that support network and decide who within that support network can help us with our emotions. Now, I'm a great advocate. I'm a great advocate for a cathartic conversation. And I think you're absolutely right. There are going to be times when it's important to have that cathartic conversation, perhaps even sit down with a group of complainers and have a good level of complaining, get it off your chest, but then know when is in, enough is enough and say, right, I've, I'm done with this. I've got it off my chest. I feel better about it. Now let's do something positive about it. Let's go and make the right decisions and go to the people within the support network that can support those good quality decisions. Go to your manager, listen to what they're saying when they say to you, you are a good salesperson. 
and let's strip it back to the basics and look at building you back up again in order that you can hit the next sale in the most appropriate way. Now, okay, uh, there's going to be time after time after time where you don't hit the sales. But uh, what you've got to do is to recognize that you wouldn't be doing the job if you weren't good in the first place. So get back to basics. What made you so good at what you do? How can you get more of that? And I think these are important questions that only you as an individual can answer. But you can get the support mechanisms in place, the support network, and the right people to prompt you with the right way, with the right statements that you need to listen to and believe in. This past year, back in January, we launched Mastermind Groups on Sales Gravy. And we've been talking about it for a couple of years, and it's been incredibly successful. And I've stepped into a couple of the mastermind groups, and it's essentially a group of people who are all professionals. They're all interested in solving problems. Napoleon Hill was the very first person to really talk about mastermind groups. That not that they weren't around since the Greek times, but um, but but I notice people who come into these groups, they're forming a peer group. They're talking about problems in a positive way. This is an issue, but they're not complaining about it. They're bringing out. And they're using the wisdom of the team to help them work through these issues. And you notice how, how much more confident people get as they go through the process, the friendships they make. How important is it for individuals to, to build those teams and those people around them that are, are, the, are the right people that they can work with before they start running into issues? Like, you know how how important is it now for you to begin investing in your own mastermind group or your or, or your own group of peers, who 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 you they count on you and you count on them, including by the way your family and friends. Yeah, but, oh, well let's let's have a look at your sales gravy mastermind groups. These are brilliant networks, brilliant support networks of people who are there purely to talk about selling and sales. They don't know your industry. They don't know your clients. They don't know anything about your organization. They don't know anything about the features and benefits of your, your product. So what you're doing is you're building up a group of people there who can support you in terms of selling. And the very fact that you're there supporting them in terms of selling will actually help to build up your confidence, your capability, and will help you with your own understanding of how good you are uh, so I think these are great opportunities for getting together with effectively complete strangers who know nothing about you. So they've got absolutely no baggage whatsoever, no preconceived ideas. They can't make any judgments about you. All they can do is interact with the person that they see in front of them and react to that person. So if you go into that sales mastermind and you are continually complaining, complaining, you're going to get that feedback fairly quickly. And the sales group is there specifically to improve outcomes, to improve performance, and to do so with the right people. So if you're not in a network, uh, one of the sales gravy uh, mastermind groups, get into one as quickly as possible. So let's let's think about you, the individual. Okay, so we established that bad things happen to good people. Does, and then uh, and then sometimes a series of bad things happen, and it feels like everything's hitting you all at one time. And it's best if you have a support group, people you can reach out to, have a conversation with. You certainly don't want to hold on to bad news. Like if you got bad news, let's peel the bandaid off. Let's let's just let's just put it on the table. Uh, as you said, we if, if we give it to someone else, we have half of it, which is a good thing. We want to avoid complaining and focus more on constructive conversations. It's important that we build these peer groups or mastermind groups or support networks in advance of things going wrong. But in that moment where bad stuff happens and you are there looking in the mirror at yourself, you are there in the dark, you are there in your car, you're, you're there hanging up the phone, you got a problem. There's this little voice inside your head that chatters away all day long. 
And it talks, by the way, way faster than you do. So it's like, and that, that internal self-talk, that, that story that you're telling yourself has a massive impact on your ability to stage a comeback. I want I want you to to talk a little bit about that that internal voice, what we say to ourselves, and how we can interrupt it when it goes negative. Like what what's the what's the mechanism that we personally can use in that moment with ourselves? We got nobody to talk to but us. How do we catch it and interrupt it? What's the framework that you use? I I'm a great advocate for affirmations, which all seem very metaphysical. And um, a lot of people do talk about affirmations uh, when they are, it all seems very new age. But I think the important thing is it's interrupting this self-talk. Hey, I'm going to share something with you I've never shared with anybody ever before. But I I think your, your question is prompting this response from me. What do I do in that situation? Um, I just kind of feel the emotion, the intensity of the emotion. It is incredibly unpleasant. And my little affirmation, the question I ask myself is, where am I going with my life? And that's the question I ask myself. And I don't don't answer it. I just ask that question. And I'm forever asking myself that question. What on earth am I doing? Where am I going with my life? And that is the question that I've got that kind of interrupts this. And I, I don't know where it came from, and I don't know how long I've been saying it to myself. But it's the right question, and it doesn't need an answer. And it kind of helps me to deal with the intensity of that emotion. And, Jeb, let me share with you something um, that I, I have shared before, because I think it's quite important here. Um, when I was working in sales, selling on a daily basis, my role was selling to um, senior doctors within the London teaching hospitals, and, and they can be really nasty if they want to be. And I had this ability to be able to engage with them on a day-to-day basis without any problems. And I could take a lot of flack from them. Uh, Quite honestly, because I know it wasn't directed at me personally. It was more directed towards my role or it was directed towards what I was representing. But uh, there was one occasion, it was a Friday afternoon, and somebody said something to me, and I can't remember what it was, but it it hurt. And, And it wasn't anything offensive. It just hit, landed the wrong way. and. I had a few things that I needed to do that afternoon, but I just said to myself, you know, I'm not going to be able to to deal with these this afternoon. I'm not in the right frame of mind. Just going to go home. And I made the decision to go home. And it, I, you know, I dealt with the other um, appointments that I had by phoning up and just postponing them all saying something had come up and I couldn't, uh, couldn't come along. And they, they were quite okay with that. But honestly, that was the best decision that I made at that particular moment in time. Any other day, any other situation, it doesn't matter. But on that occasion, it, I just got into a particularly bad place that no amount of self-talk, uh, no amount of affirmation, no amount of anything, going to treat myself to an ice cream or a can of Coke or whatever it is, is going to break that cycle of despair. I went home, forgot about it over the weekend. Oh, I wish I could have done. No, it was burning away. Um, But I, I went home. It didn't seem quite so bad at the end of the weekend. And on the Monday morning, back to my normal self. So I think you've just got to accept that there are going to be times when it's time out. Uh, There's nothing anybody can do or say. You've just got to make the decision. Enough is enough. I've just got to get away from here and go and do something completely different. And then there are other times when things are not going particularly well. (laughs) I can force myself to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, Just because I need to prove to myself, yeah, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. I'm better than this. I'm better than this. So you just got to accept there are going to be times when it 
when you have to make the decision, enough is enough. And there are other times when you have to make the decision. Do you know what? I'm going to carry on. And hopefully, hopefully, over the long term, it'll all balance out. I think that's I think that's a, a really good insight. For me, uh, I think the same thing. I think if it's something particularly bad, sometimes you just have to go, I'm just going to take the afternoon off, go fishing, just do something, just get out of the situation. What I do most of the time, though, when I have a setback is – I try to interrupt my self talk because I'm I'm just like everybody else. My voice is chattering away, and it can it can really get to me. Like there are things that bother me, and it'll keep coming back. Like it brings it back up again. And what I do is I I try to put something positive in. So uh, I'll go listen to a podcast. I mean, there's so many great podcasts out there. Uh, usually, something that's instructive, something that's good for you. I I'm not not like a non or a fiction podcast or some story. Or I want I want to hear something that's going to make me. Uh, that's going to build my resilience up. Like it's going to build my attitude up. Uh, sometimes I'll read a book, especially when I'm selling. Like I'll, I always have a sales book with me. I'll take 15 minutes and I'll just read 15 minutes. And what I'm doing is I'm turning that voice off for a minute. I'm interrupting that and I'm putting information in because typically what you put in your eye hole, like it, it has a tendency to like, or your ear hole, like it has a tendency to percolate and change the way you're looking at things. It helps you re. re- position what you just went through or reframe what you just went through. And because when you're, when, when it's bad, you frame it as this is horrible. You know, you know, everything's wrong. Everything's bad. I'm never going to be able to get out of this. But if you reframe it and say, it's not that big of a deal. It's a little setback. You got this, you can keep going. And because if I can put that in like you, I then can keep going. Sometimes I just get pissed off and I get determined. Like if I, if something bad happens, I'm just one of those personalities. I'll show you. That you will not beat me, and uh, and that's that's a frame that I use in those situations. And then finally, like one of the things that I'll do is like this morning, I'm like, you know, I had the setback. I said, screw it. I popped on some um, some Shakira, and I and I listened to some music. I was dancing when I came in. Ulysses is my producer. He's smiling over there because he knows I can't dance very well. But I was, you know, I was doing some Shakira in the car. And by the time I got in, I walked through the door and I said something nice to somebody and said, "It's going to be a great day." And, you know, we move forward. So sometimes I have to change the words that I'm actually saying and what I'm hearing to then fix the, that little message that I'm saying to myself. But I got to tell you, you know, I think that if you, if you don't manage that internal message, those words that you're saying to yourself, that is the one thing that will tear your resilience down and tear it apart probably more than anything else out there. You've, the old saying, you're your own worst enemy. Like it, you, you can create that that mess, and I and I truly believe because I know that I've experienced this myself, and this is not something that you like to admit, but I truly believe that sometimes we just enjoy it, like we enjoy wallowing in that misery for a while, um, not recognizing the damage that it's creating to our emotional resilience, because the one thing that I know to be true about cells is that. In every sales conversation, in every sales situation, the human being that exerts the um, the most emotional resilience almost always has the highest probability of getting the outcome that they desire. So, so this breakdown in your emotional resilience when things are going wrong or when you perceive that things are going wrong seriously impacts your ability to make an income. It, it can do, absolutely. And I can say what I'd like to do is to take you back to the two words that underpin the emotional resilience. Two words that um, are very, very easy to say, but very, very difficult to work with. And it encapsulates everything that we've been talking about. These two words are realistic optimism. And you're going to find yourself in the depths of despair, going down the slippery slope, wallowing in self-pity. You get some level of enjoyment from that emotion. It can feel quite pleasant in the adverse situation. Take the pleasantness and make it constructive. How can you work with it in a realistically optimistic way? I can't give you the answers. You can't give people the answers, Jeb. All you can do is just to recognize, first of all, where you are what it is that you can do, make the right choices and make the right choices and work with authentic relationships to help you to deliver the sales outcome of 
achieve the type of success that you need. Fantastic. What a way, great way to end this podcast. That was wonderful. Um, tell us how we can find you and uh, and a little bit about your, your books, where people can find your, your books. Sure. I have two books in the Authority Guide series, the Authority Guide to Emotional Resilience in Business and the Authority Guide to Behavior in Business. Both of them are on Amazon, amazon.com as well as amazon.co.uk. Um, my website is eiforchange.com. And like you, Jeb, I have a range of courses, but all of my courses are underpinned by emotional intelligence. And you can find these at courses.eiforchange.info. So go and have a look at them. Uh, we haven't set up any masterclasses. That might be something that we need to look at for the future. But uh, I've been sold on the idea of masterclasses. I sold them to myself <laughs> as I was talking about um, Jeb's masterclass. Uh, so uh, that's where, where that's a little bit about where you can find me. And of course, I'm on uh, LinkedIn. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, the name's Robin Hills. Awesome. Robin Hills, business psychologist, emotional intelligence trainer. Y'all go check him out. Go check out his books. Go check out his courses. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And folks, uh, if you got a sales team or you're an individual, go check out Sales Gravy University. It is where sales teams and salespeople all across the globe come to upskill and learn new ways to close business and grow their income. You can get a free course if you've never taken a course there using the code free course at learn.salesgravy.com. That is learn.salesgravy.com. We'll see you next time on the Sales Gravy Podcast.